Welcome to Lost in Lucha. This is going to be a series of videos that I'm calling an abridged history of Lucha Libre. In this series of videos, we're going to talk about the history of Lucha Libre chronologically, starting with the founding of EMLL and going to modern day. Since it's 90 years, I'm breaking this video into parts. Today is going to cover part one which will start a little bit before 1933, but the founding of EMLL in 1933 is going to be the first major event we cover in this episode, which is going to span three decades and finish at the end of the 1960s. I'm planning part two to cover the 70s through the early 90s, part three to cover the first decade or so of AAA's existence, part four to cover the early 2000s to the early 2010s, and part five to cover everything since. Given each of these videos can take a month or so to produce, this series may not be completed by the end of the year. This first part is the longest time frame though, so maybe the following episodes won't take as long to produce. I want to start with a disclaimer. I'm not a historian, I'm not a Lucha Libre expert, or a hundred plus year old Mexican man from Mexico City who was there for all of this history. I've always contended that I'm just a big Lucha fan, and I've read about the history of Lucha Libre since becoming a fan. This is also an abridged history. I'm going to try to hit the big stories, events, arenas opening, and the like. I won't be covering everything, though, mostly focusing on major stars and the major promotions of Mexico. We are, after all, talking about 90 years of history, so some things are going to be left out or glossed over for sure. It's no disrespect to anything I miss, but I can only cover so much in the one or five videos. I also want to give a shout out to Lucha Wiki which is a great resource for Lucha new and old, where much of this info and the photos come from, maintained by Lucha Blog or at the Cubs fan, who himself is an invaluable resource for the fandom. We start our journey at the beginning. When speaking about the birth of Lucha Libre, we have to talk about the man who is often called the father of Lucha Libre, Salvador Lutheroff. When working in Juarez, Mexico in 1929, Salvador saw some wrestling shows, which at the time were mostly being run by American wrestling companies doing shows on border towns like Juarez. Salvador then thought, why couldn't Mexico have its own promotion? Four years later, and with some financial backing, he launched Impresa Mexicana de Lucha Libre, which in English would mean Mexican Wrestling Enterprise. We'll get to the name changing to CMLL when that happens in six or so decades. For now and until then, I will be saying EMLL, as that was the name of the company at the time. They needed a venue and wanted to use Arena Nacional, which was a boxing venue, but promoters of that building didn't want to allow its use for fixed fights, so Luthroth instead bought an abandoned old venue called Arena Modelo and fixed it up to run their first ever show on September 21st of 1933. EMLL anniversary every year since has been around the same time of year, which happens to coincide with Mexican Independence Day, which is September 16th. This first year, and really the first couple of years, had many foreign talents, as wrestling and lucha libre in Mexico wasn't yet a thing having just kicked off. They didn't have many homegrown talents. The most influential of these early talents from America would have to be Cyclone Mackey, which is a name that he worked under at the first EMLL event ever, but he also then worked the following year as La... Maravella and Masquerada, or the Masked Marvel. He had his mask for the gimmick made by a local leather worker, Antonio Martinez. It was a big hit, and Antonio Martinez would make masks for decades as masks became more popular in the sport. His family still having a mask store close to Arena Mexico called Deportes Martinez. This was the seed that led to a million mask crops over the next 90 years. Despite his mask character being a jump off point for the mask characters in Lucha Libre, he only worked EMLL for the first few years and would stop working EMLL to work stateside and never returned in a meaningful manner. Jack O'Brien, an Italian-born wrestler, was originally an early foreign talent. He stayed in EMLL most of his career and is credited with inventing Tira Buzon, which is also known as the Abdominal Stretch. You will hear his name a few more times as he was around for quite some time and spent most of, if not all, of his career in Mexico. As far as early Mexican talents in EMLL, Tarzan Lopez is the first one that comes to mind. He was a highly regarded talent you would see on their cards from the 30s through the 60s, but he voluntarily left the business in the early 1960s over money disputes with EMLL when they wouldn't loan him money to help a family friend. When it comes to a Proto Santo, or the big star before he came around, Tarzan is a good shout, as is our next talent. 
Bobby Bonales, another great talent from this era and is most notable for innovating the Topa Suicida, which of course is a move that is used globally now. His name has been used for a EMLL, CMLL Cup or tournament in recent years. Of course, the most well-known star from early Lucha Libre would have to be the one, the only, El Santo. Contrary to popular belief, El Santo didn't ascend from the heavens and become the number one act as a saint. That being said, he is the main character of this era from his start as El Santo up until around the end of the 1960s. Depending on who you ask, this time frame is regularly called the Golden Age of Lucha Libre. Early in his career, El Santo the person, not the gimmick, full name Rodolfo Guzman Huerta, struggled in his first eight years in the business from 1934 to 1942, working under various monikers from Rudy Guzman, his brother was most famously known as Black Guzman, El Hombre Rojo, the Red Man, El Domino Negro, the Black Demon, and Morcia Lago and Mascarado Dos, the last of those already being used, and the original Mask Bat, who once he wasn't Mask, was called Morrissey Lago Velasquez, or Bat Velasquez, Velasquez Bat, his real name being Jesus Velasquez Quintero, compelled the Boxing and Lucha Commission that he owned the gimmick, being, again, Morcia Lago and Mascarado Uno, although he didn't use Uno, he just used the moniker. They agreed, and so Rodolfo was forced to stop using that gimmick by the commission. Morcia Lago Velasquez is credited with being the innovator of La Filomena, or the spinning kick that is so commonplace decades later across the industry. Sidebar for Morcia Lago and Mascarado, he is in many places considered the first man to ever lose his mask in a mask versus hair match when Octavio Gaona beat him on July 18th of 1940. This came after Marcia Lago and Mascarado shaved Marced Gomez, Bobby Bonales, Dientes Hernandez, and Cyclone Velaz on weekly shows the previous four weeks. Octavio Gaana instead finally won the Bats Mask, and from then on, Marcia La Lago and Mascarado would go by Marcia Lago Velasquez. He was a mainstay in EMLL and Lucha until his retirement from in ring competition in 1955. He would write and star in Lucha films after this and also trained some, with one of his most notable students being Umberto Garza, the patriarchy of the Garza dynasty. So back to Rodolfo Guzman, no longer having a mask or gimmick on hand, he turned to his manager, Don Jesus Lomeli, who was putting together a new team of wrestlers all dressed in silver and wanted Guzman to be a part of it. Lomeli suggested three names for Guzman, El Santo or the Saint, El Diablo or the Devil, or El Angel, the Angel. Guzman picked El Santo for himself, and so El Santo was born. With help from the aforementioned Antonio Martinez, El Santo had a mask and outfit made for his impending debut. His debut match was on July 23rd of 1942 in a battle royale, which saw him outlast six other men, and then had a two out of three falls match with the more seasoned Technico Ciclon Villas. He beat him so bad in the third round that the referee, who was also his manager, Lomeli, tried to stop him and was attacked too, getting El Santo his first match to end with a DQ. A week later, he beat Villas in a rematch, and the week after that, he got another singles win over El Lobo Negro, or the Black Wolf. He seemed unstoppable until an established star, Bobby Bonales, was a feat too great for El Santo, who was making a mark right out of the gate, but couldn't beat Bobby in his first big match. In February of 1943, El Santo would win his first belt by taking the Mexican national welterweight champion from Velaz, who he bested in his first two matches under the mask. A month later, in March of 1943, he would capture another title, this time the Mexican national middleweight title, thus becoming double national champion. He won that belt from Marcio Velasquez, the same man who sent him the cease and desist about using the Marcia Lago and Mascarado Dos name. Santos' first big mask defense was also versus Velasquez, who became the first of dozens of men to lose their scalp to the Silver Legend at the start of 1943, before he won either of those belts, so it was a preamble for him eventually taking the belt off of Velasquez. April 2nd of 1943, Salvador Lutheroth opened a new building called Arena Coliseo, which would host EMLL anniversary for the next decade or so and become the main EMLL 
venue during that time. For its first card ever, they booked an El Santo versus Tarzan Lopez main event. Lopez was probably the biggest star in Mexico back then, and as expected, he defeated El Santo in that match. It was still a big match for El Santo, whose gimmick and mask at this point was less than a year old. June 11th of 1943, Bobby Bonales defeated El Santo for the middleweight title, the national middleweight title, which helped build to a September 24th, 1943 EMLL anniversary show, which was hosted for the first time in the newly built Arena Coliseo for the 10th anniversary, where El Santo defeated Bobby Bonales in a mask versus hair match. So El Santo really helped christen that venue as the big EMLL venue and would have historic matches there over the following decades of his career, more so in the following decade before a new building is built, which we'll go over when that happens. We're going to take a brief aside from El Santo to talk about the belts of Mexico. In this era, the first titles in the history of Lucha Libre came to fruition. 1926 is the earliest belt, the Mexican National Heavyweight Championship, which was originally won by Francisco Aguayo, who is better known as his ring persona, Charo Aguayo, Charo meaning horseman and his nickname being El Charo or The Horseman, and would float around before EMLL was a thing, being defended in border shows that we mentioned earlier in this video that Salvador would see before he founded EMLL. Charo Guayo was really the first big Mexican or the earliest we have reports of as far as Mexican wrestlers go. He starred in films in the late 1930s and early 1940s, including the famous comedic actor Quentin Flas, first fi short film in 1939, question mark. Lucha Wiki credits him with that, but I was unable to find that co corroborated on IMDb or by watching the film, but maybe one of the men in that is Charo. Uh, that film is on YouTube in various places. I'll link it in the description of this video. These appearances were a full decade before Lucha Films really kicked off in the early 1950s. We'll speak more about that when we get to the early 1950s. Continue on with the belts of Mexico. In June of 1934, this belt, the Mexican National Heavyweight Championship, was won by Charo Aguayo versus Manuel Hernandez to crown the first official Mexican national heavyweight champion in a sanctioned match for the first time by the recently created Lucha and Boxing Commission. Before this, it was an unsanctioned belt, likely created by Charo or his manager, to bolster the shows that he was on and have him have something to fight for. The Boxing and Lucha Commission was the same commission that would create and crown other Mexican national champions for the inaugural reigns that same month in June of 19. 34. Charo Aguayo is probably most remembered for holding this title at its inception and being the innovator of La Mesadora, a submission hold where you rock your opponent on the ground with their legs and arms tied up with your own, and being Mexico's first heavyweight wrestler and the first real notable Mexican talent, again, uh, being even before EMLL was a thing. Side note, Charo Aguayo has no relationship to either Pero Aguayo, both of which we won't talk about in this first video as they weren't around at this time. Jack O'Brien was the inaugural Mexican national light heavyweight champion, beating Dientes Martinez to be crowned in June of 19. 1934. We mentioned him earlier, again being one of the foreign stars that helped build Lucha up in the early days. Mario Nunez was the inaugural Mexican national welterweight champion, but vacated for unknown reasons, and the second champion was Tarzan Lopez. Historically, this is often considered the best weight division. Mario Nunez is not well remembered, while Tarzan Lopez very much was and is remembered. Yaki Joe was the inaugural Mexican national middleweight champion, and this belt debut in 1933 before the rest of the class that was crowned again in June of 1934. It's unknown what happened from 1933 to 1937 with this belt, but Octavio Gaona won from Black Guzman in 1938. One of Octavio's other big wins was unmasking Marcia Lago and Mascarado in 1940, like we mentioned earlier, or Marcia Lago Velasquez as he would go by after he lost to Max. Jesus Anaya won the inaugural Mexican National Light Heavyweight Championship, winning a tournament final versus Black Guzman at EMLL 9th anniversary in 1942. Guzman would be the second champ, winning it off of Jesus Anaya in March of 43, before then losing to Gorilla Ramos at EMLL 11th anniversary. Octavio Gaona would also be the EMLL rep to win the NWA World Middleweight Championship from Gas Calillo in 1939, who had been given the title for already being the World Middleweight Champion in the U.S., once he lost it to Octavio, it became an EMLL belt, still called the NWA World Middleweight Championship. There are two more NWA belts we will talk about later. For now, let's get back to the El Santo timeline. The year is 1944. El Santo stops teaming with his on-again, off-again tag partner, Charo Aguayo. 
and finds a great new partner, an up-and-coming talent named Gory Guerrero. It took him most of the year to land on Gory being his new partner, and on November 19th of 1944, they would team for the first time and take on the name La Pareja Atomica. The two of them went on a tag team tear, beating any two men that were put in front of them. El Santo still being the rough-edged Rudo, to Gory Guerrero being a Technico who used his superior skills to win. El Santo at this time would pick up what would become his iconic finisher from Gory Guerrero, Quebradora de a Caballo, Spanish for the Horsebreaker, and what many stateside would know as the Camel Clutch. Invented by Gory Guerrero, but made famous by El Santo, the turning point for El Santo becoming more of a Technico was winning his first world title. When Jack Reynolds vacated the NWA World Welterweight title, EMLL asked NWA to let them run a tournament, which they agreed to as long as some of the ranked NWA wrestlers were involved. Pete Pankoff, a Bulgarian wrestler, was the NWA talent who made it to the finals and lost to El Santo in May of 1946. El Santo becoming the inaugural champ for the EMLL run of this belt, him beating a foreign wrestler with a Boston Crab submission to win the world title instead of the national titles EMLL had mostly been using to this point. Lucha Wiki says he officially turned Technico much later in 1962, but here he was given cheers and became a symbol of pride in Mexico, beating foreigners. One of the big things that helped his older tag partner, Charo Aguayo, get so over in the previous two decades. 1947 wasn't so hot for El Santo, as he lost the NWA World Welterweight title to Jack O'Brien in February, and then lost in quick order to the debuting Black Shadow, who beat him clean upon his debut in May. Two massive losses for El Santo. Two years later, in March of 1949, Salvador Lutheroth announced that there would be a tournament to decide the number one contender for the NWA World Welterweight title that Jack O'Brien still held, winning off of El Santo two years earlier in 47. El Santo encouraged Gory, a middleweight, to cut weight and participate in the tournament. They met in the finals at Arena Coliseo, and Gory won the fight by making El Santo submit. The fans assumed this would lead to a breakup, but that breakup didn't happen, and on April 29, 1949, Gory defeated O'Brien in the title match with his closest friend El Santo as his corner man. They would even team at EMLL 16th anniversary that same year in a losing effort to target Tarzan Lopez and Bobby Bonales. Okay, we are pausing here again to detour from El Santo. Most future episodes won't be so focused on one man, but for the golden age of Lucha, he really is the main character and we only have one company to talk about here. This aside isn't for a belt, but instead for a talent. El Orgullo de Orient, or the Pride of the Orient. Sugi Sito, the OG of Asian talents working in Mexico. Sito was born to a Mexican mother and a Chinese father and started his career in Mexico, where he would have his largest success. At EMLL's 17th anniversary in 1950, he would win the NWA World Middleweight Championship from the beloved talent Tarzan Lopez and hold it through the year until losing it at EMLL 18th anniversary in 1951 to Enrique Yanez. Sito would work in EMLL until 1954. From there, he worked stateside and in Canada for Stampede, never really being as big outside of Mexico. He would have many family members who also joined the business, including nephew Black Cat, who is considered a bridge between Mexico and Japan. CMLL and New Japan Pro Wrestling holds an annual Black Cat Memorial match for him every year at their joint Fantastica Mania tours, and Black Cat has a nephew who works in CMLL right now, Stigma. While Sugisito left Mexico to work up north, his brothers Panchito Robles, Hiroki Sito, Manuel Robles, more or less stayed in Mexico and all had long careers there. While Sugi Sito was the big bad Chinese world middleweight champion, Blue Demon and Black Shadow have become a strong tag team. Los Hermanos Shadow, though they were not really brothers, this was a worked relationship. The Shadow Brothers would feud with Santo and Gori, or again, their team name, La Pareja Atomica, with the latter coming out winning more often, to which Black Shadow targeted El Santo, vowing to be the better man. September 26th of 1952, at EMLL 19th anniversary show, Mexico saw El Santo defeat old rival Bobby Bonales for the NWA World Welterweight Champion, who won it off of Gory Guerrero back in July of 1951. 2,050 days or five and a half years since El Santo lost the title to Jack O'Brien, the title that made him the hero of Mexico. At the same show, EMLL 19th anniversary, Gory Guerrero lost to Cavernario Galindo, a vet who recently took on a new caveman gimmick back in 1949 and has been a rough and brash Rudo since taking on that persona. 
El Santo also got the pesky black shadow off of his back, the two finally agreeing to a mask versus mask match on November 7th of 1952, just about a month after EMLL Anniversario, which El Santo, as we all know, won, unmasking Black Shadow. This, of course, didn't sit well with his worked brother, Blue Demon, and that year saw him hounding El Santo just as Black Shadow did the year before. This led to EMLL 20th anniversary in September of 1953, where El Santo would drop the NWA World Welterweight title. Blue Demon had a dominant long reign with this title, which cemented him as the legend of Lucha Libre that he became. While he had a several years long run with this belt, he did vacate it, and there's not a reason listed for him vacating the title. In 1952, a comic would start, created by Jose G. Cruz, where El Santo was the hero, and this comic would run continuously until 1987, and is one of the reasons El Santo became an icon. It was the most popular comic book, or one of the top five most popular comic books for almost its entire reign, for almost its entire run in Mexico. He was eventually pitched the idea to be in a movie serial in 1952, the same year the comic started, which was also written by the same Jose G. Cruz, but El Santo felt that the movie wouldn't succeed. Another luchador, El Medico Asesino, who just made his debut in 1950 and debuted his gimmick El Medico Asesino in 1952, instead took the offer and starred in El Enmascarado de Plata, or The Silver Mask, where the Silver Mask Man was the villain instead of the hero as it was originally planned, to Medico's own white mask hero, or at least that's a synopsis I found. This was meant to be a serial, but was instead completed as a feature film that released in 1954. This made him into a big name despite being pretty new. At the same time, he was also made a big name by working on a TV show that he was doing at the same time as making that film. Uh, the TV show was a short-lived TV promotion on Televa Centro, what would later become Televisa as we know it now, where he was one of the main stars and was heavily featured from 1952 to 1955. It's hard to overstate how big of a deal this was. This was really the first time where wrestling or Lucha Libre was featured regularly on TV in like a weekly format. However, the promotion came to an abrupt end when Mexico City City Mayor Ernesto P. Orochuto banned wrestling from TV because he felt it was a bad influence on children. This stopped the Televisa or Televa Central promotion dead in its tracks. Uh, one example of why Ernesto and others thought that it was a bad influence on children was actually something to do with Medico Asesino himself. He came out with a attractive young woman and she would be called La Infermera del Medico Asesino, or the Nurse of Medico Asesino. And it was one of the earliest records of a luchador coming out with a female valet. The idea didn't go over well with some, so she was replaced with El Infermero, or the Male Nurse, in 1953 in the middle of this short-lived TV promotion run. Ellen Fermero would also wrestle. The two would become an iconic tag team and very close friends. When the TV promotion died in 1955, the duo were quickly brought into EMLL, already being household names for many of the same fans. These two and their all-white look would inspire future medical gimmicks. Both also innovated their own submission finishers. El Infermero would innovate La Cruceta del Infermero, mostly just called La Cruceta when not used by him, which Americans would know as the figure four leg lock. Medico Asesino made the carotid choke, which isn't used as often and was a chokehold from behind, grabbing both of the carotid arteries and squeezing as hard as he could to choke out his opponents. El Santo wouldn't really get into lucha film until 1958. This was after the genre already had some notable films, and of course, Lucha on TV and the comic books had made Lucha big pop culture fair in Mexico. One of the larger films before El Santo's debut, or the aforementioned El Enmascarado de Plata, which Medico starred in, would be Huracan Ramirez, which released in 1953. Often seen as the original or the first Lucha film, Luchadors had appeared in films already, as we mentioned with Charo Aguayo, but not many of the films were about luchadors. They would just more have cameos or, or be in a certain scene of the film. Eduardo Bonada was a wrestler who did the wrestling in action for this film and was supposed to or allowed to wrestle as the fictional luchador from the movie, who in the movie follows in his father's footsteps to become a luchador. Eduardo Bonada grew tired of the gimmick and was replaced by luchador Daniel Garcia. 
who was an extra in the original film. Garcia, who popularized the character, would continue to wrestle as Huracan Ramirez until his retirement from Lucha Libre in 1988, and played the luchador in five more films during that time in, in the series. In the late 1980s, Garcia had a dispute with the son of the original film producer, Jose Rodriguez Mas, who owned the rights to Huracan Ramirez and was making money off a Huracan Ramirez comic and wasn't sharing any of the profits, he threatened to give the gimmick to a younger guy and leave Garcia out in the cold. So Garcia, who had spent decades building the character, went around and unmasked at various shows and in public. One of the few examples of a luchador unmasking themselves publicly without losing it in a match. Ramirez, as you may have assumed, is credited with innovating the Huracan Arana. He was a legend of this era, and you may have seen many photos of him, or at least his iconic mask in cool stills. He was also a pallbearer at El Santo's funeral and wore his mask for that ceremony. We aren't going to spend too much time on Lucha Films, as it could be its own series of videos, but basically they started with Huracan Ramirez in 1953 and Medico Asesino in El Enmascarado de Plata, both of whom basically launched their careers as those gimmicks with those films. Those films are more catalysts for those two to kick off their careers, while El Santo's films are what made him a big icon. He did films later and had more than anyone else. Going through each of those, El Santo films and when they came out would be its own whole video or series of videos so again we're not going to touch too much on that. El Santo would start to appear in them starting in 1958 and he quickly became the face of Lucha film. That was through the 1960s and then when the 1970s rolls around Mil Mascaras becomes more of the face of Lucha film which feels like it mostly stops around 1979's Mysterio and Las Bermudas which starred Mil Mascaras, El Santo and Blue Demon as a team. While Lucha films happened in the 80s and 90s and beyond, they were never as big as the low budgets became more apparent as film budgets ballooned into millions and millions of dollars. That's the gist when it comes to that genre of film. To get back to Lucha Libre proper, we left off at EMLL 20th Anniversary in 1953. That storyline of unmasking Black Shadow and then losing his belt to Blue Demon at EMLL 20th is often considered the most important story in Lucha Libre. While mask matches and Lucha de Apuestas matches in general General had already been an established draw, the unmasking of Black Shadow seems to be the turning point of that becoming the stipulation in EMLL and by extension Lucha Libre. 1953 was also notable for EMLL formally joining NWA and becoming the NWA territory for all of Mexico. With this, EMLL started to use the NWA world titles as their main titles, and they were already using the middle and welterweight titles at this point. We will get to the third of these NWA titles, the World Light Heavyweight Championship, when it comes to Mexico in a couple of years. 1953 also saw EMLL expand their arenas, building a third venue, this time outside of Mexico's city, instead in Puebla and being called Arena Puebla, a building they still use to this day. It originally was managed by Manuel Robles, who you may remember is Sugisito's brother, and Robles' son, Benjamin Marr. The first main event for that building was Cavernario Galindo, El Santo, and El Verdugo versus Black Shadow, Enrique Yanez, and Tarzan Lopez. On the first day of the new year, 1954, El Santo defeated Chinese wrestler Sugisito to capture the NWA World Middleweight Championship. So El Santo wasn't without a world title for long after he lost the welterweight to Blue Demon. With this, as mentioned, Sugisito would soon move north to work more in US and Canada. These New Year Day shows in CMLL would much later become known as Sin Piedad or No Mercy. The rest of this section is going to mention El Santo several times, but he became less of the main character of EMLL at this point. Much of the rest of this video will just be going through EMLL anniversary shows. At EMLL 21st anniversary in 1954, we saw Gory Guerrero versus Cavernario Galindo in a Super Libre. Super Libre Libre means no DQ or no rules, and had happened before this, but this is the iconic old school Super Libre match. A match that ended when Galindo had a serious throat injury, which left him with what became an iconic raspy voice for the rest of his life. Some places say this was a no contest, while other reports say Gory was rewarded the win since Galindo couldn't continue. Galindo is a very fondly remembered talent and would have a big birthday bash every year in EMLL and also had parlor tricks he would do for anybody who wanted to watch. Some rumors saying he could bite the head clean off of a snake. He really tried to live the gimmick and there are promo photos of him from this era that show him in a long loincloth singlet, biting shoes as at a department store, and stalking around alleys with a big club. EMLL 22nd anniversary in 1955 had Galindo lose his hair to Halcon Negro while at the 
same time, El Santo successfully defended his NWA World Middleweight Championship versus Black Shadow. El Santo would also defend the same belt versus Black Shadow at Arena Puebla's second anniversary show in July. El Santo beat Halcon Negro for his mask at Pusio Final, or the Final Judgment, in December of that year. This would be the first Pusio Final, and the only early one we know of for sure until 1965. This is a name that CMLL would use even as recently as 2019. In 1955, Mexican National Women's Champion was crowned on La Dama and Mascarada, or the Mass Lady, but she would quickly lose it to Irma Gonzalez, who would go down as the big female star of this era, and held this belt many times. Just like the tag titles we'll talk about in just a bit, these early records for this belt are spotty, so we likely won't bring it up too much in this era, and probably won't bring it up much until women's wrestling picks up more in the latter half of the century. The most notable thing to happen in 1956 wasn't that, but instead finish on construction of Arena Mexico, which was built where the original Arena Modelo was, this building was desperately needed, as with El Santo's popularity, the comic book, Lucha movies, and TV coverage, Lucha was too popular for Calicio to see everyone who wanted to come see it, so they had to build a new arena. How did EMLL finance that arena rebuild? No joke, they won the lottery. <laughs> The CMLL employees entered a lottery pool together and won. With the earnings, they financed Arena Mexico to be built, and to this day, they have been running their main shows there. At the time of its construction, and maybe to this day, it's the largest arena or venue built specifically to host wrestling events. This is an important distinction, as most arenas used in the US and Japan aren't created specifically for wrestling. April 27th, 1956 is when the flagship arena for EMLL opened, with El Santo and Medico Asesino beating the team of Blue Demon and Rolando Vera, with the semi-main being El Infermero beating El Gladiator. EMLL 23rd anniversary in 1956, the main event was El Santo beating El Gladiator for his mask, which was the first ever EMLL anniversary show to happen at the newly built Arena Mexico, which again became their main arena upon its completion. El Gladiator, who El Santo unmasked, was a bodybuilder who was pushed heavily for his muscular build and would come dressed as a gladiator. He had a bad reputation in regards to his use of alcohol, and on more than one occasion would show up drunk. In 1957, there was a tag tournament to crown the inaugural Mexican National Tag Champions. El Gladiator showed up drunk and started to attack his own partner for the tournament, Galindo Cavernario. The two were facing Sugisito and Hiroki Sito, uh, brothers in the quarterfinals. This led to an all-out brawl, and in this scuffle, El Gladiator pushed a lucha and boxing commissioner, and this led to the lead commissioner, Manuel Munoz to ban El Gladiator from wrestling in Mexico City for life, which basically ruined El Gladiator's career as a bigger name. Despite the drama, the tag tournament ended with Black Shadow and Blue Demon becoming the inaugural tag team champions by besting Tarzan Lopez and Enrique Yanez in the tag team tournament finals. This year marking the start of EMLL having more of a tag division, though the lineage for these tag titles is pretty spotty up until way into the early 80s, so we won't be speaking too much of it because of that reason. Also in 1956, EMLL and the Lucha and Boxing Commission decided to cr crown a new Mexican National Heavyweight Champion, as it had been vacated and the heavyweight division had been in the weeds since the days of Charo Aguayo, who originally held the belt. Medico Asesino bested Gran Lothario in the tournament finals to capture his first and only belt in EMLL. Gran Lothario was also known as Jose Lothario, who most may have heard of being the man to train American wrestling star Shawn Michaels, aka HBK. Medico Asesino never formally left EMLL, but starting in 1957, he would work in Texas and as a heavyweight challenge the overall NWA world heavyweight champ of the time, Lou Thez. He challenged Thez on four occasions during Thez's tour through the Texas Territory. These series of bouts were very well received and he would capture the regional NWA Texas heavyweight title five times, the NWA Texas tag titles twice with Pepper Gomez, in 1957, he, El Infermero, and El Santo would team for a series of matches as the original La Ola Blanca, or the White Wave, a name that would be used by other talents who donned white together, most famously after them, and Hel Blanco and Dr. Wagner, who would use the name with El Infermero. We'll touch on that later. In 1958, Doral Dixon defeated Al Cashley for the vacant NWA World Light Heavyweight Championship, thus bringing the belt to EMLL. This would be Doral's only EMLL or Mexico belt, 
but he continued to work in Mexico as well as the U.S. until his retirement in 1987 and is by most still considered the black talent to leave the biggest mark in Lucha Libre, though he is rivaled by another star in the 1990s who also only had one title reign in Mexico. We'll talk about that other person when we get to the 90s. EMLL 25th anniversary featured Torbellino Blanco, who was a touring Spanish wrestler who shaved Sugisito earlier in 1958, before then losing his own mask to Expectro Uno as the Lucha de Apuestas match for EMLL 25th anniversary. Torbellino Blanco main evented versus Galindo at 26th anniversary in 1959 as well, where he would lose his hair to Galindo. Expectro is a very well remembered gimmick and mask, but the original had to retire suddenly in 1959 because of a botched Martinetti, or as people would call it stateside a pile driver. Upon inspection, a doctor suggested he immediately retire. He was only 20 years old. His gimmick lives on and his spectros are still working to this day. His close friend, Karloff Lagarde, who'd go on to become one of the biggest stars in the 1960s, offered to pay for his surgery, but then EMLL themselves stepped up to pay for it. The spectro would sparingly wrestle after 1959 retirement, but never worked full-time again. The spectro fundraiser shows would happen for him throughout the years. I cannot be certain, but this could be the catalyst for the Martinetti or the pile driver being such a band move in Lucha Libre. One of the spectro's other great Great career highlights was being the opening main event for EMLL's fifth and final built arena, Arena Coliseo Guadalajara on June 21st of 1959 versus Blue Demon. That was the opening uh, main event for that show. Arena Coliseo Guadalajara opening is also the start of a prolific Lucha Trainers tenure there as the lead trainer. Diablo Velasco, who is considered one of the greatest trainers ever, despite not having much of a notable career as a luchador himself. He started training people in the early 1940s at a general boxing and lucha gym before taking the job at EMLL's new arena, Coliseo Guadalajara, when it opened again. June 21st of 1959. Throughout his training career, he was someone that people would seek moving to Guadalajara or going to the Guadalajara gym to train with. Uh, he's very well respected and, and trained a lot of people, basically almost any guy who worked in EMLL for like a 30 to 40 year span. EMLL 27th anniversary in 1960 had several title matches. Ruben Juarez versus Ray Mendoza tournament finals for the Mexican National Light Heavyweight Championship, which Ruben won. This belt was vacated by Espectro Uno, again, who was forced to retire. Gory Guerrero successfully defended his NWA World Light Heavyweight Championship versus Sugisito, and Rene Guajardo took the NWA World Middleweight Championship from the defending champion Rolando Vera. The biggest thing to happen to the Lucha world in 1960, however, was not EMLL 27th anniversary. Instead, it was the tragic passing of Medico Assassino. While working in Houston in 1959, he was feeling ill and came home, where he found out he had an advanced form of cancer. Its aggressive nature took his life on June 16th of 1960. This was the first luchador death in Mexico that was considered a national tragedy. The star who only debuted 10 years ago was gone. The movie and TV star was mourned by fans and enemies. Polo Torres, Broadway Venus, and Tonina Jackson, who had all lost mass for his hair matches to the heavyweight, had photos of them mourning published in various Lucha magazines. While they were his greatest enemies in the ring, they were some of his closest friends outside of it. El Infermero, his longtime friend and tag partner, was booked for an Arena Coliseo show in Monterey when old school wrestler and current promoter of that venue, Ciclone Velaz, broke the news to him, which led to Infermero sobbing and mourning at the loss of the Mexican national heavyweight champion, who never lost that belt. A man responsible for El Infermero's career being as successful as it was, and his closest friend, Friend. Medico Assassino never lost a Lucha de Apuestas with that gimmick either, and with his death, El Infermero would be getting pushed as a feel-good story in the early 1960s, winning a few Lucha de Apuestas and joining forces with the new La Ola Blanca, Dr. Wagner and Hel Blanco. EMLL 28th anniversary in 1961, Rene Guajardo successfully defended the NWA World Middleweight Championship versus El Santo, and Gory Guerrero successfully defended his NWA World Light Heavyweight Championship versus Rey Mendoza. Both of these matches were new versus old matches, a younger Rene versus the seasoned El Santo, and the older Gory successfully defending versus the younger Rey Mendoza. EMLL 29th anniversary in 1962 had Antonio Posa successfully defending the NWA World 
World Middleweight Championship versus Karloff Lagardi and Benny Gallant shaved Galindo. These winners were both imports from Spain and both of these wins were to build them for their eventual big losses versus Mexican talents. Benny was usually billed from out of France, though originally billed from Spain. And I believe he actually is original from Spain, but in character, maybe French. Manuel Gonzalez Riviera, the man who became Dr. Wagner in 1962, was between gimmicks when the promoter, Elias Simon, who ran the territory in northern Mexico, suggested he use the name El Hio del Medico Asesino, but Manuel Riviera didn't like the idea as Medico Asesino's death loomed large even two years later, and claiming to be the fake son of a dead legend may have gotten him more heat than fanfare, and Manuel Riviera wanted to make his own mark, thus becoming Dr. Wagner, instead getting the name from composer Richard Wagner. As mentioned, when El Santo won his first NWA world title, Lucha Wiki says he turned Technico instead later in 1962. Feels like he had been a Technico before this as well, but in 1962, when teaming with Espanto Uno and Espanto Dos, they left him high and dry as he was getting beat on by the good guys. He then turned Technico himself and feuded with both Espantos. EMLL 30th anniversary in 1963 was the first time ever that an anniversary show was two nights. September 6th, Ruben Juarez would unmask Espanto Dos, and on September 27th, Ruben Juarez would lose his hair to Espanto Uno. Then, just about a month after that, Espanto Uno would lose his mask to El Santo in what is considered one of the great mask wins for El Santo, only topped by that of Black Shadow about a decade earlier. Also around this time, Gory Guerrero would leave EMLL and go to work in the NWA territories north of the border. The main reason cited for his departure is he didn't want to put over Ray Mendoza for the NWA Light Heavyweight Championship and took his ball and went home. In 1967, Ray Mendoza would be the person to hold the belt that Gory vacated by leaving, beating the original champion for EMLL, Doral Dixon, in a tournament final. Ray Mendoza would be the on-again, off-again champion for that belt over the next five years. Coincidentally, around this same time when Gory was leaving EMLL in 1963. El Santo teamed with Blue Demon for the first time, his once-hated rival, and in the years following, the two would become a regular dream team to pull out for certain events, but never became a full-time or formal tag team. EMLL 31st anniversary show in 1964 went back to just one night. The two big matches were Karloff Lagardi winning the NWA World Welterweight Championship from Huracan Ramirez. Rayo Di Jalisco won the NWA World Middleweight Championship from the Spaniard Benny Gallant. At one point in the mid-1960s, I think 1963 for about two months, Karloff was holding the Mexican National Middle and Welterweight titles while also holding the NWA World Welterweight title. In some photos, you will see him wearing all three of these belts. EMLL 32nd Anniversary Show in 1965 was the most stacked EMLL anniversary card to this point, or at least as far as we know, as many cards before and after this one are just shown as one or two matches. Here we had El Santo and his protege, Rayo Di Jalisco, beating Benny Gallant and Henry Peluso. Ray Mendoza and Rene Guajardo would fight to a double knockout. Fonto Uno would successfully defend his Mexican National Light Heavyweight Championship versus Mil Mascaras, and Carlos Lagardi successfully defended the NWA World Welterweight Championship versus Huracan Ramirez. Mil Mascaras would debut in the summer of 1965, with his first big singles feud being with Benny Gallant, who he would shave in 1966. Also in the summer of 1965, El Gladiator was slain in a barroom brawl. Similarly, Espanto Uno in 1968 was also slain in a barroom incident, this time by a barkeep. These deaths didn't rock the lucha world in the way that Medicos did for various reasons. Neither were as big as names like Medico, and their passings being scuffles instead of cancer made them less sympathetic. EMLL 33rd anniversary in 1966 would be two nights again. Jerry London defeated Karloff Lagardi in a hair versus hair, and would lose his own hair to Rene Guajardo on night two. These shows happened the first and last Sundays of that September. Night 2 also had El Santo and Rayo de Jalisco defeat Black Shadow and Mil Mascaras. 1966 would be the time when Dr. Wagner and Angel Blanco would form their tag team in EMLL. La Ola Blanca, which had El Enfermero included as a third. Uh, he was getting a little older, so he would eventually be replaced. And Dr. Wagner and Angel Blanco would move on to become big stars in EMLL in Mexico over the next couple of years. EMLL 34th anniversary in 1967 would see Angel Blanco unmask Angel Exterminado, who originally worked earlier in Europe as one of the most famous mask wrestlers there, where he was known as Longa Blanc. He lost his mask to Black Mask in Queen's 
Tall leads England in 1962 before making his way to Mexico to be in a big Angel vs. Angel mask match. That same week, just days earlier, he shaved Black Shadow. He didn't use Lonja Blanc in Mexico because that's basically the same name as Angel Blanco but in French. And also, Lucha and Boxing Commission rules say that you do need to change mask if you're going to remask. And it should be about five years later, which lines up pretty perfectly with him losing his mask in Leeds in 62 and then showing up in Mexico about five years later to lose a different mask, but basically the same White Angel gimmick. In June of 1967, Mil Mascarez won the Mexican National Light Heavyweight Championship from Espanto Uno. Again, Espanto Uno died in that bar fight in 68, so the following year. Mil Mascarez would lose it to El Nazi in October of that year, and then win it from him in March of 68. He would eventually vacate it, no reason was given, but he did start working California in 1969 around that same time. These are the only titles that Mil Mascaris has ever won in Mexico, despite his larger-than-life name and how much people associate Mil Mascaris with uh, Lucha Libre and Mexico in general. He actually didn't hold many belts in Mexico. These early ones in his career are really all he ever held. EMLL oftentimes have anniversary shows for arenas as well. The 12th anniversary of Arena Mexico in April of 1968 had Huracan Ramirez unmasked El Enfermero was 45 at that time and slowing down. EMLL 35th anniversary in 1968 had El Santo and Ray Mendoza retain the Arena Mexico Tag Team Championships versus Dr. Wagner and Angel Blanco, or again, La Ola Blanca, who were quickly becoming the premier tag team of Mexico. Rene Guajardo successfully defended his NWA World Middleweight Championship versus Tony Oxford, a British talent on tour in Mexico for the year, and Carlos Lagardi successfully defended his NWA World Welterweight Championship versus Blue Demon, continuing again to be one of the main stars of the 1960s. This same year had a new star debut in EMLL, a man alone, El Solitario, who debuted in September and got his first major win by winning a mask vs. hair match versus Rene Guajardo just a handful of months later in December. And around this time, he would take El Enfermero's spot in La Ola Blanca, the three of them, Wagner, Blanco, and Solitario, being the most over trio in the country in quick order. The 13th anniversary of Arena Mexico in April of 1969 had Rio de Jalisco win the NWA World World Middleweight Championship off of El Santo, a real passing of the torch moment as Rayo had been his protege for the last couple of years, and Rayo winning this belt is kind of signifying him as being one of the next big things. Black Shadow and Ray Mendoza defeated Los Hippies, Renate Torres and El Vikingo in a hair vs. hair match on this same show. Note, this El Vikingo is not the one who is father to El Hio de Vikingo. This one worked quite some time before El Hio de Vikingo's dad uh, worked as the same name, El Vikingo. EMLL 36th anniversary in 1969 would have Ray Mendoza successfully defend his NWA World Light Heavyweight Championship versus Dr. Wagner, besting him for the title just like he did his partner Angel Blanco originally to start that reign. El Salatario beat Ray O.D. Jalisco for his NWA World Middleweight Championship Ship. This EMLL anniversary was two nights, but night two was just Solitario beating Rayo again to retain for the same belt. Of course, there were probably more matches than that, but all we know that happened on that second night was again Solitario retaining the title that he won from Rayo by fighting Rayo again. Mil Mascaras in 1969 would shave both Bull Ramos and Black Gordman in the LA Olympic Auditorium. This was the beginning of him working NWA Hollywood in America for the next couple of years. In 1969, Mil Mascaras won the NWA America's Heavyweight Championship, the NWA America's Six Man Tag. Tag Championship, the NWA America's Tag Team Championship, and the NWA Pacific Coast Heavyweight Championship, all in NWA Hollywood. Some of those belts he won more than once in 69, uh, dropping them and then winning them back. Uh, the late 60s and early 70s in NWA Hollywood would be his most championship prolific run. As a touring talent, Mil Mascaras was sometimes passed over for titles. Not in NWA Hollywood, though. We will go more into that in part two, as we're actually going to end part one, uh, this first video right here. Historically, the 40s through the 60s is considered the golden age, with El Santo being the face of that era, it being the biggest boom era in that, the history of Lucha Libre as well. We went over why TV, movies, comics, El Santo, Medico Asesino, Huracan Ramirez, Gory Guerrero, 
Cavernario Galindo, Salvador Luthoroth, Tarzan Lopez, and EMLL building the arenas that would host their empire for decades to come. You may have noticed El Santo becoming more of a tag match draw. You could say that closed out earlier than the late 60s, but I think his icon status was cemented through the films, which were mostly in the 1960s, and his big passing of the torch could be seen as losing that NWA World Middleweight Championship to Rayo de Jalisco in 1969. The era just before that is what I would label as the prehistory era. El Santo wasn't the first luchador, but he is often seen as the luchador, and Lucha Libre not being what it became until he showed up, and his first big match was that at EMLL 10th anniversary, the main event versus Bobby Bonales where he shaved him. El Santo though was far from the only star of this era. Many others were making national fan bases and some were even getting known in America with Medico Asesino, Gory Guerrero, and Mil Mascaras all working matches stateside. I picked 1969 as the last year for this part because we just got introduced to Mil Mascarez, Dr. Wagner, Angel Blanco, and Solitario, who will all be major players in the next part, and it feels like the Silver Age of Lucha Libre would be the 70s into the early 90s when another major shift happens. So subscribe and ring that bell. Part 2 will be coming hopefully in a couple of weeks, maybe in a month or so, and we'll cover 1970 to 1991. Two decades of action for Part 2. If you liked this video, please share it with anyone you think would find it interesting uh, like and subscribe uh, i would like this video to do good numbers it, it did take quite a lot to write this script and then record the you know i don't know because i haven't edited it yet but i would guess about an hour of uh, voice recording so if you like this please uh, share it with people uh, stay tuned we'll be doing four more parts the coming parts might have more video links there's not going to be any video links here except for maybe some of the movies if i can find them and even those i don't think you can find really easily online uh, i'd love to see huracan ramirez if anyone knows where you can find that online please share it in the comments uh, that's one of the main movies i would like to see of course, the movie that Medico Assassino was in would be interesting to see as well. Uh, a lot of this, there's just no tape, so I'm not going to be linking tape in this video or uh, in the body of this video like I have for some of the videos I've done lately. Again, there's just not any tape really of this era, so I can't really share what there's not tape of. But uh, if you do have anything that you think would be interesting, share it in the comments. If you have anything that you want to say, if you think I left anything out, like I said, there's some stuff I'm going to gloss over. Even some of the guys I mentioned, I don't really go into too much detail talking Talking about some of that's on purpose because we'll we may talk about them more in future episodes especially if they were one of the guys that debuted in the last couple of years of the 60s anyways with that uh, this video is coming to an end again please like and subscribe let everybody know I'll be sharing it obviously but it'd be nice if I could have anybody else share it to anyone who you think would be interested the history of Lucha Libre is very interesting I feel like it's a big blind spot for most American fans so if this video can help I'm glad it could uh, good night and stay tuned for more Lost in Lucha.